So let's go to Luke 23. Come on, Chief. So uh, before we jump into the, um, the scripture, well, last week we talked about Jesus being crucified on the cross. And you had those two criminals. One was making fun of Jesus, and the other one was, he had a repentant heart. So actually we are going, we're going to go dive in into the same part of the story. And before I begin, I want to, you know, I want to share with you that it's a privilege, you know, to be a brother in the church. Mm. Because the Bible tells the brothers, the men, to lead the sisters. And, and, and most, of the, most of the time, the brothers, like, get to make the decision. Consider the sisters as well. And there were times, you know, there were times when the sister that I was working with together, maybe she was struggling emotionally and maybe not really effective uh, on campus. So I would go tell my mentor what's going on, the situation. And Joe, my mentor, he would always tell me, Chi, it's your fault. Yeah. I was like, huh? No. I, did you hear what I said? It's the sister struggling. On, and he said, Chi, it's your fault. Because you are not leading the sister like Jesus would. Wow. And he said, the, they, like the sister struggling right now, it probably would have never happened if Jesus was leading the sister. Wow. So you are not being like Jesus. Okay? Amen. Amen. Come on, Chief. And there were times when maybe a brother in my ministry is not really changing. And I will go to Joe, my mentor, and explain the situation. And he would say, Chi, it's your fault. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be like, hey, Joe, did you, did you see who I mentioned? It's the brother, it's not me. <laughs> And he would say, Chi, it's your fault. This brother, he's not changing because you are not inspiring him. Mm -hmm. Jesus inspires people and you are not being like Jesus. Wow. I'm like, amen. And there were times, you know, when nobody was struggling, when I was struggling. <laughs> Maybe I, I wasn't happy. I would go to Joe and be like, Joe, I'm not happy. This is what's going on. And Joe would say, Chi, that's your fault. <laughs> I was like, what? On, I, I don't get it. And he was like, Chi, you are not happy because you haven't made the effort to build a life that you enjoy. Jesus was always joyful, and you are not being like Jesus. So after all these conversations, I learned that it's always my fault. So I learned, I learned to apologize in every single um, intense conversation. I just apologize. And I learned that I'm always guilty for all the problems in my life as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the title of today's lesson. Everyone is guilty. Come on. Everyone is guilty. Come on. And let's go to Luke 23, verse, verse 44. Come on, Come well, so let's pick up at the last moment when Jesus was on the cross, about to die. Mm -hmm. In verse 44, the Bible says, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called her in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I come with my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed, he breathed his last. So the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. So I remember when I was younger, so I grew up in Macau, and I remember whenever there's a thunderstorm, my mom would always tell me that, hey, God is angry, even though she, was, she, she wasn't a Christian. She would say, hey, this God, he punishes people who do evil. So, and when we look at the Bible, when we look at the, the, um, um, the flood in the time of Noah, it was God wiping out the evil off the face of the, um, the earth. Yeah. And whenever there's a natural disaster, it's God trying to get our attention. And here this centurion, he probably has witnessed so many crucifixions, so many executions. And right here, instead of saying this man deserved to die, he said, wow. This guy, Jesus, he's innocent. After looking at this darkness for three hours, somewhere in his mind he was thinking, oh my goodness, we messed up. 
we killed an innocent person. And that's Jesus. And God is not happy. And here the people, you know, the people who called Jesus to be killed, and now they felt guilt. They felt this shame. They walked away beating their breast and going away. And they knew they messed up at, uh, at this moment. Have you ever done something? You were so certain that you were right the moment that you did it. And soon after you realized that it was the worst thing ever. Raise your hand if you ever done that. Well, I mean, we need some honest people. All right, all right. I'll be the first one to admit. I remember um, there was a long period of my... Um, a long period in my life, I was going against Christianity. I thought that it was just a religion where weak people go to find comfort. So I will always make fun of uh, people who go to church. And then I quickly realized that I was so wrong when I was going through the darkest moment of my life, when I wanted to commit suicide. That's when I realized that Christianity is true and it works. And at that time, I remember I beat my breast, just like these people, and I humbled myself before God to learn His way, to learn who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And what about us today? Are we still doing the things that are wrong in God's eyes, but we think are right? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. What do you guys think about lying? Do you guys think it's wrong? Do you guys think it's a sin? Well, you know, in, in, this, uh, in Hong Kong, you can get so much more benefits by lying. You can get a lot more out of people, the society, through lying. And we think we are being smart, and we try to protect ourselves. But the truth is, lying is what cowards do. Yeah. Lying is when someone doesn't want to show their true side, because they don't like something about themselves. Or what about not giving our best to God? Sometimes we think we always sacrifice so much already. So, so, we, so we pull back our giving financially, financially. We pull back our heart to people. But think about what kind of church this church would become if everyone starts to pull their heart back from each other. I mean, I don't know about you. I know one thing for sure is if that happens, this church will become a church that nobody wants to come to anymore. Yeah. And what about, you know, gossiping? slandering or just straight up insulting each other. Well, I believe we are so used to insulting each other in Hong Kong, yeah. like sarcasm, you know, just talking down people, mm. that we think it's okay. Yeah. Not but it's not okay. okay. Yeah. How would God feel if He sees you insulting His sons or daughters? Mm. I mean, he, I'm sure He won't be happy. Yeah. And I also believe gossip and slander are the easiest ways to lose your friends. I remember when I was younger, when I was in school, I got this best friend, his name uh, was Andy. And, uh, and we were best friends, and I remember this one time I was in the, um, in the rest washroom just washing my hands. And he came in, he, he was furious. I mean, he didn't say, hey bro, how are you doing? What's going on? He just straight up punched me. I was like, bro, what's going on? And he, and, and he said, were well, you talking trash about me? I said, no, bro, like, you are my best friend. Why would I talk trash about you? So what happened was, he heard gossip from other people about me gossiping him. Wow. So instead of getting understanding, he came to me and just punched me straight up. And after I told him what happened, he felt really, really bad. And actually, he looked really dumb for punching me. I mean, seriously, I was like... I was like, amen. <laughs> so, it's the easiest way to lose friends. Yeah. Slandering, gossiping. And let's go to Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21. Here the Bible says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. We need to be very, very careful with what we say because what we say can destroy our own lives as well as the people around us. Yeah. And personally, I, I've seen that happen so many times yeah. before I became uh, a Christian. You know, I, I've seen people, because of slandering, you know, families were, family broke apart 
you know, marriages broke apart. Dating relationships broke apart. Childhood friends broke apart. Mm. I've seen it all. Mm. And back to the scripture in Luke 23. So after, so, so here it says, the curtain of the temple is torn in two. Well, so the curtain, the veil, it was to cover the, um, the most holy area of the temple. And only the high priest could enter it to, to, to worship sacrifice, mm -hmm. atonement for sin. So one potential meaning for the curtain torn in two is that the temple is no longer where God lives in. Mm -hmm. Now God is going to go wild to all the Gentiles to share the gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. That God is no longer going to live in the temple built by human hands. Yeah. And here the centurion, he saw Jesus as an innocent and righteous man. And Jesus, many people they would say, hey, Jesus, he was innocent at this moment. But you know what? That is simply not true. Mm -hmm. Just like anyone else, Jesus, he was guilty on the cross. In Mark and Matthew, some of Jesus' last words were Eloi, Eloi. Lama Sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. And in other scriptures, we see that, hey, Jesus, he was perfect, righteous, innocent, the Lamb of God. But that very moment when he was on the cross, he took upon himself all the sins of the world. All the sins in the past, at the present moment, and in the future. Mm. And now... I mean, you and I, we both know that you know, when we do something really, really wrong, when we do something very sinful, you just get that feeling that hits your heart. It's like, ugh, yeah. man, I know I messed up. Now, that is just one sin. And imagine Jesus being totally righteous his whole life, being totally innocent his whole life, and then on the cross, he's hit with every single sin okay. in history every single sin at the present moment and every single sin in the future. And all these sins, your sins and my sins, all these sins separated him from God. Mm. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine getting stabbed with a knife mm. by a knife to the chest. Again, 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 and again. So on the cross, Jesus he was guilty, not because of his own sin, by which he didn't have any, but because of yours and mine. Mm. And in case you still don't understand what that means, that Jesus died for our sins, I'll give you a perfect analogy. So imagine Shiny, the, the, the sweet, innocent angel, who was up here to share what the cross means to her. Yeah. Imagine if me, in a house with a stranger, and I killed that stranger with a knife. And I deserve to go to jail. And then Jesus comes in, ready to cook for Bible talk. And she saw what's going on, and she came, come, comes up to me and says, she give me the knife. You walk away, go home. Mm -hmm. The police comes, they arrest her. She goes to jail, suffer her whole life. I will feel very, very guilty. Yeah. And shiny, will go to jail with the hope that I won't ever kill another person again. Mm -hmm. Her punishment moves me to repent. Same thing with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He died for our sin should motivate us to change, mm -hmm. to become better for Him. Yeah. And let's read verse 49 again. Here the Bible says, But all those who knew Him, including the woman who had followed Him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So here it's funny how Luke, the author of the book, he said all those who knew him. Instead of calling them disciples, he said all those who knew him. So at this point, Luke, he couldn't call these disciples his disciples anymore. They were just people who knew Jesus. Mm. And Luke He's trying to communicate that, hey, there was nobody close to the cross. 
Everybody was standing at a distance mm. when Jesus was dying. Everyone was guilty. And the death of Jesus changed people who want to kill him. It changed criminals, pedophiles, homosexuals. And I put before you, that's why we take communion. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. So this is Apostle Paul telling us the meaning of uh, communion. Here, Paul says, So that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why so many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. It's interesting that communion is not a time to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. It's a time to remember His death. Yeah. When you break the bread, you are not just breaking some bread or some cracker. You are actually breaking the body of Christ. The same thing with the Jews. It's not just Jews, it's the blood of Christ. Yeah. And he says the reason why people are not doing well spiritually is that we are not focused on the death of Christ. Mm. Well, think about how powerful is the death of Christ. It's powerful enough to turn people who didn't believe, to turn those people who weren't crucified, and those people who called to kill Jesus, but they ended up walking away, beating their breast, and feeling the shame. Mm. And now today, you might be doing awesome spiritually. Well, you are commanded by the Lord. But if you are a disciple and you are not doing awesome spiritually, then you are in one of these three categories. So Paul, he says, that's why some of you are weak, fallen asleep, and sick. So what does it mean to be weak spiritually? Well, weak, being weak spiritually means weak because something tragic happened and you are having a hard time of, to focus on the Lord. So maybe a relative passed away and that causes uh, grief in you. So you have a hard time focusing on the cross. And what you are going through right now is just God trying to prepare you for something bigger and greater in the future. And the pain and the struggle right now is actually good for you. Yeah. And the second thing Paul says, that's why some of you have fallen asleep. Mm. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Come on, Here the Bible says, The angel of the church in Sardis right. These are the words of him, who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deed unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Also here in Revelation 3, Jesus he says, These people, they have the reputation of being alive but inside they are dead. It's time to wake up. So that means someone could be coming to church Wednesday, Bible talk on Friday, Sunday at church every week. But spiritually, they are not disciples anymore. They come as a visitor, not a disciple with the heart to love God and do anything for God anymore. That's what it means to be fallen asleep. And there is a third category, and we don't really talk about this. Um, spiritually sick. Well, what does it mean to be spiritually sick? Well, when you think about a sick Christian, it's someone who is bitter, someone who is critical. Maybe they are unhealed from past sins, or maybe they are, they are, they are in sin, and they haven't repented from it. And pe people in this category, they need forgiveness. Well, not just forgiveness from God, but also forgiveness from their heart. To forgive people who have sinned against them. Mm -hmm. Another example would be if a brother is 
constantly or, or, or have, have, um, in the habit of watching pornography or masturbating, that, that brother is sick. And we need to help them. But first, we need that brother to confess and get open first. Yeah. And the death of Jesus changes the disciples who are weak, who are sick, and who have fallen asleep into sold out disciples of Jesus Christ. And let's go back to Luke 23, verse 50. Luke 23, verse 50. So this is after Jesus died. And verse 50, it says, Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arithmedia, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. Well, so here Joseph, well, he was a member of the council, the Sanhedrin, the group of people who sent Jesus to Pilate to be crucified. So the religious, religious leaders, and Joseph was one of them. And here in this scripture, he was mentioned, and he was someone good. You know, he cared about Jesus, and he didn't approve of the people killing Jesus. But let's look at what John says about this Joseph. Let's go to John, John 19, verse 38. John 19, verse 38. And here the Bible says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of meal and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial, burial customs. So let's start there. So Luke, he said, hey, Joseph, he was upright. He was this righteous man. But John, John he mentioned something that Luke didn't mention. He said, John, he was a disciple of Jesus, but nobody knew about it because he was scared of the Jewish leaders. And here in this scripture, you can see that the death of Jesus changed the heart of Joseph. And it changed the heart of Nicodemus. When Nicodemus, in, back in John 2, he came at night to visit Jesus. Because he wanted to follow Jesus, but again, just like Joseph, he was afraid of other people's opinions. And now after the death of Christ, they were like, man, man, we're done with this. Like, we've been cowards for too long. But now let's go to Pilate and ask for the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, so I've got a question for all of us, including myself. Are you a secret disciple? Are you ashamed of the name of Jesus? And I'll be the first one to confess, sometimes I can act like Joseph. I can act like Nicodemus. Then there were times on campus when I was sharing my faith with someone, and then I see this other group of people or this other person coming by, I would lower my voice intentionally. So the other people, they, would, they, they won't hear me talking about Jesus or the Bible. I was like Joseph. Mm -hmm. At times, I could be afraid of people. Oh. And some people, they are all fired up at church, but out of church, nobody knows that you are a disciple because you are afraid. And here what we need to appreciate about Joseph is that after realizing that he's been a secret disciple, Joseph, with the courage and the boldness, he went straight up to Pilate. The guy who approved the death of Jesus, think about it. Think about the, the, the conversation. You know, Joseph be like, hey, Pilate, can I have um, the body of Christ? And Pilate was like, hey, why? And he boldly and confidently, he said, because I'm a disciple of this person. Wow. Can I have his body, please? And maybe after he got the body, he was carrying the body with Nicodemus, 
and some other Jewish leaders saw that, and they started to persecute them, started to threaten them. And Joseph, he was like, you know what, guys? Forget you guys. This Jesus, he's the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. I'm sick and tired being a hypocrite like all of you. And he just like kept on walking with the body of Christ and buried it. And when you look at Hong Kong or even the world, you have so many problems, so many hypocrisy in churches. Yeah. And this is the reason. Because nobody, nobody is willing to stand up and say, hey, this is what I believe. People, people like that, they dream. They dream to do great things for God. And I was talking to some disciples last night, and it's already December. You know, just four more weeks and, and 2018 will be in history. Yeah. Mm, wow. And the question is, do we have dreams that we pray for and want to see happen next year? And I really uh, appreciate King, King's humility. He, he, he told me that, hey bro, there are three things that I want to work on. I mean, three goals that I want to accomplish next year. And he said, communication skill, he want to build his charisma, and he want to build his knowledge of Christianity. And we sat there, and then we watched some professional public speakers on YouTube. And I was like, hey, Ken, if you want to learn it, imitate all these people. If you want to increase your knowledge, listen to some sermons by some great preachers in the kingdom. And we still have one month before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Do we choose to just chill, like pilot, maybe washing his hands? and say, hey, it's not my business. Or are you, are you gonna use this time to jumpstart a brand new year, 2019? Maybe you wanna get dating, or maybe you wanna get married. Well, let, let's on paper write down what are the reasons and what are the things that you need to change to be a mature man or a mature woman worthy to be married. Or maybe you wanna baptize how many ever people that you want. Well, again, let's look at Put things on a piece of paper. Look at your schedule. How much time do you chill and how much time do you work hard yeah. for the Lord? When Jesus was on the cross, everybody was guilty, including Jesus. Because he, he was bearing the sins of yours and mine. Jesus, he took our place on the cross so we don't have to suffer. He died for our sins. Now the question is, are we willing to live for Him? We are all guilty, but we can all choose to do great things for God. And I want you to think about this question as we close out. Will you do greater things for God? If you want to, get with the person who invited you and really, really study the Bible and see what God wants you to do. And to God, be all the glory. Amen. Oh, 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 oh,